It is my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, theologian and scholar. He is the auxiliary bishop in the Archdiocese of Los Angeles, the founder of a worldwide apostolate. He was ordained a priest in the Archdiocese of Chicago in 1986. And it is my great pleasure and distinction to give to you Bishop Robert Barron. Well, thank you for that beautiful introduction. Well, my fellow graduates, I want to reflect with you this morning very briefly on the meaning of the formation in the Catholic intellectual tradition that you've received here at the University of St. Thomas. A standard view on display today in practically every nook and cranny of our cultural life is that the individual person has the prerogative of creating his or her own values. Freedom, especially the freedom of self-determination, is practically unassailable. You know what? Frankly, I cannot think of anything more boring. If we define our values, our own truth, our own purpose, we effectively lock ourselves into the tiny space of what we can imagine and control. When we follow these prompts of our culture today, we become cramped souls. What the medieval philosophers called pusile anime, that means little souls. The entire point of a Catholic intellectual formation is to produce magne anime, that means great souls. A great soul doesn't invent her own values. Rather, she intuits the marvelous intellectual, moral, and aesthetic values that are found in the objective order. And then she responds to them with her whole heart. And she thereby expands in a manner commensurate with the goods that have captivated her. You know, the basic purpose of the initiation rituals found among primal peoples around the world was to convince a young person that his life is not about him. Typically, in these rituals, he would be wrested away from his comfortable domestic environment He'd be scarified in some way, instructed in the lore of his tribe, and then equipped with only a few provisions, he would be cast out into the jungle or the forest or the tundra and told to make it on his own. This was not arbitrary cruelty. It was an invitation to move out of his own tiny space and to discover the objective values in his people's history, in nature, and finally in the spiritual order. Your time here at the University of St. Thomas has been a kind of ritual of initiation. The point of these past past four years has been to break you out of your self-regard and to invite you to an adventurous exploration of new worlds of thought and experience. You know, something that concerns me is that safe and safety have become for the present generation such conspicuous words. Now, no one denies that a modicum of safety is required 
for any sort of peace of mind or achievement. Nevertheless, one would be hard pressed to say that a religion that places at the very center of our attention a man nailed to a cross is concerned primarily with safety. According to the cliche, ships are safe in harbors, but ships aren't meant for harbors. They're meant for the open sea. In a similar way, you are indeed safe within the confines of your own desires and expectations, but you're not meant to live in that small world, but rather in the infinitely wider and more fascinating world of objective value. You know, two areas I think that your generation is especially attuned to objective value would be the natural sciences and social justice. In the course of my evangelical work, I find that among many young people especially, there's a great reverence for the sciences and the technology they produced. Even as they demonstrate sometimes a certain impatient with other disciplines, they tend to accept physics, chemistry, medicine, engineering as authoritative. But here's the point. In doing so, they are acknowledging an extraordinarily significant realm of value, namely objective intelligibility. No scientist, physicist, chemist, astronomer, psychologist, etc., could ever get her work off the ground unless she believed that the world she investigated were marked by form, pattern, and understandability. The responsible researcher is not inventing intelligibility. She's finding it, following it, rejoicing in it. And I would say that you and many of your peers are passionate about issues of social justice. You're eager to fight corruption, discrimination, race prejudice, inequality. You advocate for inclusivity, the acceptance of diversity, care for those on the margins of society. Good. In doing so, you are acknowledging the existence of certain moral values that you have not invented and that apply in all circumstances. None of you, I wager, would say that racism or sexism or human trafficking are acceptable in some contexts or that opposing them is simply a matter of personal opinion. No, no. In point of fact, you feel so strongly about these matters because you know they are moral absolutes that summon your attention. Like the intelligibility of the world discovered by the scientist, so these objective moral truths draw you out of yourself and into spiritual adventure. Now, just one more step. If the patterned structure of nature and moral values are not projections of our subjectivity or the mere products of a social consensus, but rather objective features of reality, we readily ask, okay, where did they come from? The answer of the great Catholic intellectual tradition is that they came from the Creator God, who is intelligibility itself, who is moral goodness itself. They come from the God who is 
supremely wise, supremely good, supremely beautiful. And who, therefore, ought to engage our attention most completely? The great command found in the sixth chapter of the book of Deuteronomy and reiterated centuries later by Jesus himself gives expression to this conviction. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength. Now we can see the point of a Catholic education. To beguile you with the objective values, epistemic, aesthetic, and moral, that exist in the world and that direct you finally to the divine source of those values. Once you understand this, you're ready for spiritual adventure. You're ready to move the ship out of safe harbor. You're ready to become a great soul. Well, friends, how can I address this assembly and not make reference to your great patron, St. Thomas Aquinas? In the second part of his magnificent summary of Christian doctrine, Thomas discusses the virtue of magnanimitas in his Latin, magnanimity, the quality of having a great soul. Here's what he says. Magnanimity, by its very name, denotes the stretching forth of the soul to great things. That pithy definition expresses everything I've been trying to say in this address. What are these great things that Thomas references? but those objective values that summon the soul. And so the key to a spiritually successful life is to go for them, to stretch out toward them. It's to stay within the musty confines of the self or to see the values in question but never to reach out to them is to settle for a kind of spiritual mediocrity. Here's St. Thomas again. Just as the magnanimous person tends to great things out of greatness of soul, so the pusillanimous person, the small-souled person, shrinks from great things out of littleness of soul. And so, young friends, my fellow graduates, identify some value that you've learned here at UST. Some goodness or truth or beauty that has sung to your soul and then give yourself to it with a kind of reckless abandon. Stretch out toward it and it will give you satisfaction and finally lead you to God. You know this, that the literature of the world is filled with stories of people who have spent their lives satisfying their egos, building up wealth, pleasure, power, and honor, but neglecting the development of their souls Perhaps you've met some of these people, glittering on the outside, but atrophied on the inside. And perhaps you've encountered the opposite case. Those who have very little in the eyes of the world, but who are vibrantly alive, spiritually on fire, for they've cultivated their souls. 
There's a story told of Thomas Aquinas that I particularly savor. Toward the end of his life, Thomas was laboring over the section of his great Summa Theologiae dealing with the Eucharist. Though it's commonly taken now to be a masterpiece, Thomas himself was uneasy with his treatise, convinced it did not do justice to the mystery he was trying to describe. And so he placed the text at the foot of the crucifix and asked for God's help. Well, according to the story, a voice came from the figure of the crucified Lord. Thomas, you've written well of me. What would you have as a reward? The great man could have asked for anything, for fame, for wealth, for powerful office. But instead he said, non nisi te domine. I'll have nothing except you, Lord. Fellow graduates, the patron of this university spent his life seeking and discerning objective values. And he knew that all these goods find their source in the supreme value of God. His soul stretched out to great things and finally to the creator of these great things. In a word, the purpose of this university is to make you like Thomas Aquinas. So, put the ship out to the perils and possibilities of the open sea. Stretch out to great things. Be great souls. And God bless you all.